Abu Musa, which was a convert name. He would have been a Persian convert. Originally, you see those statues they blew up in Afghanistan. Buddhism had come this far. Originally a Buddhist, a uh, person of Buddhist uh, background. Um, so this was a revolt against Arabism in a way. It was a revolt on the part of the oppressed peoples of the empire, not a part of the Arab uh, glory of the empire. It was a, a group to be more Islamic, treat everyone more equal. That's why uh, the Abbasids are usually known as the Islamic Caliphate, not the Arab Caliphate. And the <laughs> capital was changed. They changed the capital to a place that didn't exist yet, Baghdad. Now we all know it quite well, but it hadn't existed then, at that time. They built it from the stones of the former Persian capital, which was not far away, called Ctesiphon. And Baghdad was a round city, uh, built according to modern architectural standards of that time. A very modern, forward-looking city that was purposely built as a capital. Didn't exist before. If it did, it was just a little village. And they built it out of the ruins of this Persian capital that was not far away. And it became the fabled center of the Abbasid Empire from around the 750-51 period until the collapse of the Abbasid Empire. And how many years later? I think around 1257. So this center of Arab Islamic civilization lasted for 500 years. Who destroyed it? The Mongols. The Mongols destroyed it. Wiped it out totally. Exterminated everybody in it. Leveled it to the ground. Because the Mongols, when they came, didn't mess about. They followed a scorched earth policy and terror and uh, the fear of them was part of the policy to intimidate everyone who was in front of them and make them realize that there was no point to resist Mongol expansion. And they, we hear about the Mongols in Europe, but the Mongols were most devastating to the Middle East. They were finally stopped in Palestine. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll cover this next time. I will cover it next time. At a battle called Ein Jalut, not far from the Sea of Galilee. A lot of battles were fought in Palestine uh, by the Mamluks. And I'll tell you about the Mamluks next time. So I'm going to continue this history up to the present next time. So then we'll move over to cultural subjects after I finish the history. But it's a great history. I mean, you see how romantic and exciting it is. And anyone who studies Islam uh, should do it. Did you do this in your previous Islamic course, the history? No. Anyone who uh, does the history, anyone who does Islam should, of course, do the history. It's a really exciting history, and it, it, it fills everything in properly for people. Uh, as you see, I mean, I'm not, I have it in my head for some unknown reason. I don't know how it got there, but uh, I think because of my oral exams when I was a PhD student, my professors made me read Arab and Islamic history, so I read everything that there was, so I, began, I learned it. And then when I came to Caltech Long Beach, I taught it. But, uh, it stayed in my brain, so it's just uh, a lot of other things that doesn't stay in my brain. My wife says, you can't even remember what I was wearing on such and such night 25 years ago. You don't even remember what we ate. And I'm like, no, I said, I haven't got a clue. I can't remember anything. I don't remember what anyone looks like. I don't remember anything you ate. I don't remember what dress you were wearing. I don't know anything about anything, but I can remember history. I know all history I ever, I ever studied. So some people have some brain that, that remember some things. My wife can remember exactly what people said at a dinner party 35 years ago. She knows exactly what clothing they were wearing. She knows how they parted their hair. Is that how you women feel? Are you able to do that? I don't know. I can't do it, that's for sure. I don't know how the men feel in this room, but all I can remember is history. That's the only thing I can remember. I don't know anything else. Uh, okay. And history of everything. I can do the American history for you. I can do the Jewish history. I can do the Christian history. I can do whatever you want. You name it. As I said, this Roman thing on television at the moment, I told you last time, is pretty good. And you might want to watch it because it's uh, so popular. It takes place against the background of Roman history. And the Roman history is pretty accurate. It's on HBO. It's a 10 or 12 part series. I, I, I do recommend it. Not for the soft porn in it, and the, which is, I guess, the 
I pulled it there and said, we have included a little bit of pornography to please the gentleman of the press. Well, they've included a bit to please titillate you, you readers. But there was a lot of pornography in, uh, in uh, uh, Rome at that time, so um, it probably can be considered accurate. But they have a kind of uh, melodrama in the, against the background of the history of Caesar, his rise to power, his assassination, and the rise of his uh, successors, Mark Anthony, Octavius, uh, Brutus, Cleopatra and so on. So it's actually pretty, and it's not only about them, it centers around the common people who make up their armies. They're the focus of it. And it's, it's a bit of upstairs, downstairs, with uh, soap opera, porn, Roman stuff. But the history is, history is strong. History is, is so far pre-active to the general history. I know the guy who wrote it, so in fact, I, I know that he cares about history. He's a former Marine, and he wrote the script to Patton, so since he wrote the script to Patton, he's a guy that cares about history. He would not. Uh, he wrote the, also wrote the script to, uh, what's that movie uh, um, uh, 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 Coppola made about the Vietnam War, uh, where they go up the, the heart of darkness. Uh, what's the name of that movie? Uh, now. Yeah, he, he wrote the script of Apocalypse Now. Too. So the guy who, who wrote the script and uh, created this thing is a pretty, he, he's pretty accurate sort of historical. But he knows how to put melodrama into it. Too. Anyway, let's go back to the, um, the Baghdad. The Abbasids come to power. Abu Muslim, he gets paid off like all uh, good servants get paid off. They execute him because they don't want any rivals, and he's considered a threat because he was too successful. So when you uh, serve powerful people and you do things for them, like the Bush family, don't be surprised if in the end you end up on the scrap heap, like poor Scooter Libby is going to end up. Uh, because uh, great families do not feel gratitude towards people who help them get where they are, because they're too much of a competition and threat for them. And this is all through Islamic history we're going to find this uh, problem of uh, propagandists who help families rise not being uh, given uh, a lot of uh, credit and uh, honor thereafter. So um, there's a romantic story attached to all this. As the uh, Abbasid army sweep into Syria, all the Umayyads are killed with their families and everybody else, but one Umayyad prince escapes. He's just a young boy. I don't know how old he is. He's maybe um, maybe the same age Muawiya was when he came up <laughs> with his brother. But uh, it's a romantic story. He's an Umayyad prince. His name is, is Abd ar -Rahim. He has a freedman who helps him too, called Badr. 